First thing to note about the offensive into Idlib is that, uh, at least in public, the Syrian regime acknowledges that this is something that the Russians are keen for them not to pursue. Um, but, of course, Russia, by uh, very successfully, it must be admitted, tilting the balance of military power in Syria on, to the favour of the regime has led to a position where they actually don't have that many tools uh, to restrain the Assad regime now militarily, even if they want to, uh, when it suits their geopolitical interests to be seen as peace brokers. Um, because unlike uh, when they intervened a couple of years back, uh, Assad is not facing, you know, predictions from all counts that he's going to potentially lose power, uh, that the rebels uh, and the jihadist groups are going to, you know, push him out of large sections of Syria that they currently held. Uh, he's now very much on the front foot. So Russia uh, will struggle, I think, to restrain uh, the Assad regime, particularly so, so break, as break, break the it down for diminishment us, of ISIS. Uh, break it down for us. Why would Russia be against uh, the Syrian offensive against the rebels in Idlib? Well, Russia has um, positioned itself geopolitically to try and achieve a couple of goals in Syria since its intervention. Uh, the first being to prevent the fall of uh, a major ally. Um, they've been very stung by Western uh, regime change uh, efforts in, obviously, Iraq, um, but also Libya, for example. Uh, and they're determined that, uh, given they have very strategically important uh, port at Tartus, uh, which is their only Mediterranean access port, uh, and also they had uh, interests with air power access, as they now have through Latakia, uh, they wanted to maintain that and maintain uh, President Assad's uh, presence. But they also want to be seen as a power broker. Uh, you know, Vladimir Putin's main geostrategic aim is to be seen as a top player and someone, sorry, someone who needs to be consulted whenever there is uh, some form of crisis. So if he can't then restrain uh, and hold his own ally uh, and supposedly more or less puppet uh, to a peace deal that Russia you know, helped broker with Turkey, uh, which you know, commits to these uh, de-escalation ceasefire zones of which Idlib is one, then that makes Russia's credibility as a sort of future peace negotiator or at least power broker in future conflicts uh, much more suspect. The other thing to, to note, of course, is that uh, Russia uh, is pursuing a much more conciliatory relationship with Turkey now. It sees Turkey as a potential crack in uh, the NATO alliance, uh, particularly as, as President Erdogan moves further and further towards a sort of nationalist, Islamist uh, profile. Uh, and so with the recent agreed sale of uh, the most advanced Russian air defense system, the S-400, to Turkey, uh, Turkey is very, very opposed to the Syrian army retaking Idlib. And therefore, for Russia, this is also a thorny issue because Turkey's on the opposite side from them. So who's behind these mysterious drone attacks? Well, there's been an enormous amount of use of uh, weaponized uh, commercial drones uh, by particularly ISIS, but lots of rebel groups uh, on both sides uh, in Iraq and Syria, in particular Syria. Uh, we've also seen it in Yemen. Uh, and it's worth noting that the photos that emerged of the uh, captured crash drones as, that were part of this supposed attack on the 5th and 6th uh, against Russian facilities at Tartus and uh, Latakia uh, is very, very primitive components-wise. I mean, it's built out of commercially available, um, very, very primitive stuff, but it's nonetheless very effective. It's basically a model aeroplane with a GPS um, following capability, you know, a la a smartphone, um, and a small explosive package. So this is not, you know, the heavy level of sophistication that the Russian regime and the Russian Ministry of Defense is trying to, um, you know, stress because it's embarrassing for them that, that they've, you know, suffered potentially damaging attacks on airfields facilities. Uh, but also that, you know, they're trying to tie this to potentially Western or even Turkish involvement by implication, saying, you know, well, this has to be state sponsored. It has to be state supplied in terms of fusing, GPS, etc. The reality is that insurgent groups have been using this sort of improvised UAV technology for years now. All right, so it's crude enough so that it could be anybody. Uh, let, let me ask you about uh, the shelling of Ghouta there, that uh, eastern enclave of uh, Damascus, and uh, it's it, it, it's very brutal. Is this going to continue indefinitely? Uh, I think as long as the Syrian civil war continues in its current guise, uh, that is uh, characterized by very large-scale, long-duration urban sieges in effect, uh, I think the latest report suggested more than 400,000 Syrians still living under siege uh, in various parts of the country, uh, then, yes, this sort of shelling and aerial bombardment will continue. Uh, the sad fact is that for you know, a Western uh, public that, largely speaking, has grown used to seeing war portrayed, 
with varying amounts of accuracy as a relatively clean exercise uh, fought with precision guided munitions, exquisite technology, very, very minimal civilian casualties by previous conflict uh, standards. Uh, it's difficult for us to, to have to admit and, and you know, understand that Unfortunately, the Russian and Syrian regime approach of massively heavy bombardments, uh, terror bombardments uh, of besieged towns, Homs, Aleppo, and now Idlib and Ghouta uh, as well, uh, has proven extremely effective. Uh, you know, it's not nice, but this is the Russian approach that was uh, developed uh, to deal with Grozny, first of all, where they basically flattened the entire city um, before taking it in the second, uh, second conflict there. And it, it works. It's very inhumane, but it works. And, uh, and there's little, if no, response these days from the West. I mean, we, we have a, a U.S. president who uh, you know, clearly has a lot of personal admiration for the Russian president. Uh, and judging by his pushes to reportedly uh, open up the rules of engagement constraints vis-à-vis uh, -vis collateral damage for coalition airstrikes, is certainly not overly personally concerned with collateral damage per se. Uh, and also, of course, uh, from the West, there is no strategy for Syria. Uh, the, what we saw as the moderate Syrian opposition that came out of the initial Syrian revolution, Syrian civil war, uh, is now very, very small in terms of parts of the country it holds. There's a lot of really fairly unpleasant uh, hardline Islamist groups that are fighting Assad. And of course, the Assad regime is also still fighting ISIS. Uh, alongside the Kurds, who our own NATO mm. allies, the Turks, can't stand. We, we don't have a plan for Syria. So it's very hard to you know, even formulate a way we might try and get tough with the Russians, as it were, who, which you would have to do, uh, who have a serious military presence in Syria and are carrying out a lot of this alongside the regime, uh, without, at the very least, some sort of desired end goal that you could try and then leverage concessions towards. Justin Bronk of uh, the Royal United Services Institute, many thanks for being with us from London.